He touched me, oh, he touched me, and now there's joy that floods my soul. Hi, dear friends. Pastor Dan here. And uh, I thought that the day that I would, uh, as I always do, <laughs> welcome you who are joining us for the first time. And if you are joining us for the first time, as we gather around God's holy and infallible word, that I always say is the only word of truth going out into our nation today, for that matter of any nation. But if you're joining us for the first time or on a regular, I would invite you to, to reach out and click on that little light bulb because that way you're subscribing and you're always going to know when we're having a new study. And dear friends, that is important as we continue on uh, past our study today, as in our next study, we'll begin our journey following Jesus to the Gospel of John. And then from there into the revelation of Jesus Christ, where I promise you that all the fake news that you hear today will become the real news of tomorrow, and you'll have a biblical perspective of what's going on in our nation and in our world. And by the way, while you're there, why not invite a friend, maybe a family member, or for that matter, maybe a former friend, because you just don't know as we come together around the holy and infallible word of God that a former friendship just might be rekindled because you cared enough to reach out with the love of God. Now today in our study, before going forward to the Gospel of John, I thought we'd take a vision, a look at the vision of Isaiah, uh, of God's suffering servant. My hope is that this vision, given over 600 years before Christ's incarnation, will make our study in John that much more significant to you. And with that in mind, I suppose, for lack of a better name, if I were to give our study today a name, I would, it would have to be along the lines of God's suffering servant. So with that in mind, let's turn to our Bibles to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 through 6. Now, reading from the scripture itself, we read, it's 54, I think 53 comes before that. It says here, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground, he has no form or comeliness. When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Thus saith the Lord. Now, Isaiah the prophet was the son of a gentleman named Amos, and he's often thought of as the greatest of the writing prophets. His writings fall into the category of the four major prophets, and in proper order are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. These four then are followed by what we call the twelve minor prophets, beginning with Hosea and ending with Malachi. Now the name Isaiah means the Lord saves, and this would be in keeping with the ancient tradition of, of a person's name pointing to something about their life, something that would be fulfilled in their life, in this case his message to Israel. He began his ministry in 750 B.C. He was married with two sons. He spent most of his life in Jerusalem. You could say he's a city man. He's quoted by several of the New Testament writers and is even quoted, dear ones, by Jesus himself in referring to himself. Much of Isaiah's message to Israel pointed to the, to the future coming ministry and suffering of their long-awaited Messiah. The problem, though, for the Jews of Jesus' time was it made no sense to them for the coming Messiah to be anything less than a, a, a someone who would lead them out of their bondage to Rome. I mean, a suffering Messiah, that was the last thing they needed. They had enough suffering to deal with. But God was concerned about a greater bondage. They had one that, one that reached beyond Israel, one to which the Son of God became the servant of God to redeem the world for God. And so our text today is often referred to, as I say, as a suffering servant. My intent is that in him alone you will see that, in, in, that there is abiding peace in a troubled world. So Isaiah goes on in verse 1 to say, Who hath believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been reveal, revealed? Who hath 
believed. That, dear ones, is a rhetorical question that expects a negative answer. And that answer would be nobody. At this, as this verse points towards Jesus Christ as the suffering servant, in referring to Jesus, John quotes us quotes for us in chapter 12 of his gospel. Although he, Jesus, had done so many signs before them, they, Israel, did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who hath believed our report? Should sound familiar. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then there's Paul in Romans chapter 10, verse 16. Not all have obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Now, because Isaiah uses the word our to refer to ancient Israel, you have to be careful in reading verse 1. Lord, who has believed our report, or literally our message? The report or the message referred to is not one that they've delivered, but refers to what they've received or heard. And that is the message delivered to Israel by prophets such as Isaiah, and especially in this text as it relates to the good news of salvation coming through the awaited Messiah. Isaiah was not waiting, Israel was not waiting or looking for a suffering Messiah. And as a consequence, they missed their visitation. Only a few would recognize a servant of God coming on the scene as, the, as a suffering servant, Isaiah unfolds in this text. So posing this question today would be like asking, who could have believed what we have heard? And as I said, the answer implied by the question is nobody. What was being proclaimed was just so incredible that it seemed likely no one could accept it, ever accept it. And you need to understand the position of ancient Israel is not unlike that of people today, especially the unrepentant, the unredeemed. Even you today, I mean, do you truly believe that you are in any way worthy of someone literally giving up his life for you? For someone to willingly die in their place was a hard message to accept. It was nearly impossible for the ancient Jewish mind to, to comprehend and wrap around such love. It is as Romans 5 and 6 tells you. When you were still without strength or in an unholy state, unable to help yourself, in due time, God's chosen time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, he says, for a righteous man will one die, but yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God, which negates those last two statements, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It could be said, and it is said, while God loves you just the way you are, dear ones, he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. And so the question is posed, who has believed our report? And the question is, have you? Now when you read the second question in verse 1, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? You might like to know that the first two words that we will see later in verse 2, for he will help you to know that the word arm in verse 1 does not refer to the revealing of an appendage, but to a person. Given the meaning of the word arm, the person being revealed is one of strength, one of power, and one of authority. It refers to the person of Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, that tells us, through being in, Though being in the form of God, he made himself of no reputation, or literally emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, Coming in the likeness of men and, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, none other than our Lord Jesus. Do you know that scripture tells us in Hebrews 5, 8, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered? You need, listen, you need to know this does not mean that Jesus needed to learn obedience in the sense that he was disobedient. For he said, I do always those things that please the Father. What he experienced and what he learned was what it was like for you and for me and all mankind to learn obedience. And he did it for you. In verse 2, Isaiah relates to the growing process and appearance of this servant. He writes and says, For he shall grow up before him, meaning God is a tender plant, and as a root, out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This person, this Jesus, 
though unrecognized by the world, was carefully observed by God. And so Isaiah tells us he would grow up before him, before God, as a tender plant. You need to know that term tender plant refers to a shoot rising from a decayed trunk or stump, and in this case, from ancient Israel. This plant gave no promise of beauty or value. It was just like a root out of dry ground, and the dry ground ones refers to Israel, the decayed stump or trunk. And for us today, anyone living outside of God's favor, the word root refers to the one Isaiah 11.1 1 calls the stump of Jesse or the lineage of David. So leaving the symbolism and using a more direct reading of the, of the first part of verse 2, you can see that it simply points out that this servant will arise from lowly conditions. There's simply nothing about this person that would cause you to take notice of him. And that's why the second part of verse 2 tells you he has no form or, or, or stately manner, no calmness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should have looked or even desired him. So with this verse, Isaiah simply tells you that this authoritative figure would arise from lowly conditions. He would wear none of the usual emblems of royal authority, thus making his true identity visible only to the discerning eye of faith, perhaps, dear ones, even your faith. Because of his lowly demeanor, we see in verse 3, he is despised. He is rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. I hope you see that Isaiah is not saying he will be, but that he is. That is the way it is with prophecy. It often speaks of what is coming as already happening, assuring that it will be done, and it was done. Now, Isaiah foresees that, that the hatred and rejection by Israel and mankind in general toward the, this servant, who suffered not only external abuse, but, but in internal sorrow over the lack of response from those he came to save, and dear ones, that includes you and it includes me. And that gives rise to the question, what has been your response? Does he still experience sorrow over you? Some of the ex of that hatred and that rejection he suffered was foretold again in, by Isaiah in chapter 50 verse 6 he says I gave my back to the smiters there it is present tense I gave my back to the smiters literally those who gave stripes and my cheeks to them that literally plucked out the hair his beard I hid not my face from shame and spitting do you know that Psalms 126 tells us that the plowers plowed my back and made their furrows deep. I gave my back to the smiters. And after this beating, Isaiah 52 verse 14 tells us, there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness from the torture that he endured. In our text, Isaiah continues in verse 3, telling us that this servant was not only a man of sorrows, but he was acquainted with grief. And dear ones, you need to know that this is not a play on words. In this case, sorrow and grief are not synonymous. Now, we, now we, we begin to uncover the real rejected message and why you can't afford to reject it. Here the word listen, I mean here <laughs> the word sorrows, even in the Hebrew means exactly what it says. Much of the sorrow he experienced was a result of sin's curse. Your sins, my sin, the sins of the world coming upon his pureness. And you know, it, it, it's not that it just comes up on him, it comes within him, and we will see that as we proceed. Scripture is clear in 2 Corinthians 5.21, tells us God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. If sin only came upon him, he would not be made sin. It came in within him, our sin, your sin, the pureness of his body. There was no other way for that exchange, his righteousness for our righteousness, and our righteousness for his righteousness. It could not happen no other way. With our sinful nature, even in our greatest sorrow, how could that compare to the anguish ripping apart his inner being when he cried out from the cross, Eli, Eli, Hela Masabakhtanai. 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The only place he would ever have to say that. The result of sin's curse is expressed in the word grief. Isaiah uses it in verse 3 and 4 and verse 10. In all three instances, it has the same meaning. In the Hebrew, it's kole, and it means, listen, it means sickness, affliction, and disease. Isaiah states that this servant was acquainted with it. He understood it. Listen, have you, have you at any time in your life just sort of timidly turned your face away from diseased, crippled persons of grotesque appearance? Let's, let's, let's be honest. I mean, nobody likes to look at suffering. There are a lot of people in this world, even from time to time, visitors in a church, even church goers, because they don't understand the ugliness of it. They turn away from Calvary. They don't want to look upon it. It's uncomfortable. It's a reminder of their own failure. Before, listen, before any of us turn to intently look upon the suffering servant, we were guilty of turning away. So if you're in that position today, Jehovah, you're in good company. The point is, that's exactly what Isaiah says Israel, like all of us, was guilty of. He closes verse 3 saying, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. When Isaiah uses the word we, he's speaking of Israel's unbelief and their aversion to a crucified Messiah. In other words, sickened and repelled and disgusted by the sight of his agony and the appearance. Like so many people today, they were contemptuous of him. They turned their faces away. And their reaction lends itself to the last phrase of verse 3, he was despised and we esteemed him not. It simply means that they looked at his suffering and the hatred heaped upon him and did not care. They did not give him so much as a thought. And the Bible declares we've all been there. We've all done that. Maybe, maybe you're there today and just need to take another look, a fresh look at Israel's rejected Messiah. I mean, after all, it was for you that he endured such agonizing shame. Romans 6, 4 tells you, through your, though your sin, through your sin, you were there. Our old man, our old nature, he says, was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Throughout the busy days of your life, do you give him due consideration? Or do you, are you so busy, you basically esteem him not? Regardless of your answer, with verse 4, Isaiah tells you, surely, surely he has borne our grief. He's carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken of God and afflicted. So here, Isaiah speaks directly of this servant's vicarious or substitutionary suffering. That this servant was suffering for others is obvious. The language allows no other interpretation. In fact, Matthew uses it in referring to Jesus in chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 of his gospel, where he says, When evening had come, they brought to him, Jesus, many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick, that it might, listen, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sickness. Surely, he has borne our grief. You need to know the word born. It does not just mean to carry away. It has the more profound meaning of wearing or literally taking upon himself. Hence, being made sin. As I said, in the, our sins came into him. He was made to be sin. Isaiah is saying that this servant, this Messiah, would carry the weight and the consequences of our sin on and within himself and literally carry our sorrow away. In verse 4, in the Hebrew, sorrows is makob, with the meaning of pain and sorrow. You might, you might find it interesting to know, according to the cultural customs of that day, if a person suffered pain or sorrow, he or she was considered as being chastised by God. So when you read verse 4, yet we esteemed him stricken of God and afflicted, it's like saying that this servant was considered as getting his just dues, being punished for his own sins. 
But in verse 5, listen, listen to Isaiah's response to that opinion. But, which kind of negates the other two, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now you might find it interesting to know, in the Hebrew the word for wounded means that he was pierced through. It reminds you of John 19.33, where after Roman soldiers had broken the legs of the criminals crucified with Jesus, when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. That one of the soldiers pierced his side with his spear and immediately blood and water came out. Who then is this one pierced through for all your transgressions? He's the one that Zechariah foretold when he said, they will look on me whom they pierced hundreds of years before it ever happened, but yet there it is as being done. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieves for him as one grieves for a firstborn, they will look on me whom they have pierced. And so we see Isaiah is saying, even as John reported in chapter 19 of his gospel, that Jesus would be pierced through for our transgressions, yours and mine. And if that don't grab your heartstrings, consider then what Isaiah said in verse 5, he was bruised for our iniquities. The original meaning was, he was cut to pieces for our iniquities. So you need to know, as used here, the word iniquities met punishment. It becomes increasingly apparent that his suffering was endured for someone else. And you can only imagine then what you mean to him. He was pierced through for your transgressions. He was cut to pieces for your punishment. And you need to know the chastisement of our peace, your peace, was upon him. And this is far more than peace of mind, though that is definitely a result. The peace referred to is your peace, your peace with God. The word chastisement is correction. In the Hebrew, it refers to the correction by which your peace with God was obtained. You and I live in a troubled world and a more troubled nation, perhaps more than any generation before us and that's because we are a troubled people seeking peace people seek to have a peace in their own hearts especially today but they seek it from a fickle world different mandates going out day by day different opinions a fickle world that gives and takes a world or country at odds with God can offer nothing in the way of lasting peace. And so people go in circles seeking the latest fix. But you, dear ones, as a child of God, must never forget that Jesus said in chapter 14 of John, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Simply means, as Scripture tells you, the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. He has not changed his mind about you. And only God's suffering servant has the power and authority to make you this offer. Only peace with God can give you lasting peace in your heart. And the correction needed to obtain it was laid upon God's suffering servant for you in your place. So the question arises, are you at peace with God today? If not, then come to God's suffering servant. Finally, in verse 5, Isaiah tells you, with his stripes we are healed. You need to know when reading this that it's not necessarily as presented. You need to go a little bit deeper. Now the casual reader will take it as he sees it. But you need to know and understand in the Hebrew that word stripes is not plural and consequently does not refer to something that can be counted as in the 33 stripes laid upon the body of Jesus that cut him to pieces. It's comforting to believe that through the flogging laid upon Jesus we are healed. And that, dear ones, is part of the meaning, but it is not the meaning. Isaiah is not presenting you with two separate episodes of atonement to resolve your spiritual needs. 
He's referring to the crucifixion and the stripe by which you are healed in his atoning sacrificial death. And by this alone, you are made whole, body, soul, and spirit, salvation, healing, and deliverance for the whole person for you. And so Isaiah is telling us, not only would God's suffering servant be pierced through for your transgressions and cut to pieces for your punishment, but the correction needed to obtain your peace with God would be laid upon him. And listen, with his death, you are made whole, body, soul, and spirit. You might find it interesting to know that Peter confirms this in his first epistle when he states that Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed there are two things you need to know about this verse in the greek as with the hebrew the words for stripes is singular and in the original reads the original reads by whose bruise and does not refer to Christ's flogging, but to the stroke of divine judgment administered vicariously to Jesus on the cross. By this and this alone, God's ser suffering servant has made it possible for you to be made whole again in body, soul, and spirit, the whole person for God. For those times in life when you're feeling down on yourself, don't look in the mirror and dare think you see your true value look at calvary and see yourself there in the heart of god's suffering servant and to that end in verse 6 our last verse for today isaiah gives you the reason for it all he says all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the listen the lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all and so it's no wonder that jesus told us he's the good shepherd like sheep, we, we, we more often than not follow our own fancies and turn to our own ways. Like sheep, we sometimes follow those grazing in the wrong pastures. And the irony is we do this deliberately. We do this repeatedly, even to our own detriment. And so we see that Isaiah clarifies his statement about sheep by saying, like them, we wander off to do our own thing in our own way. But dear ones, there is a better way with safer pastures. Jesus said, I am the way. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. The suffering servant of Isaiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, has efficiently and completely paid the price and shouldered the consequences of sin and the righteous wrath of God deserved by us sinners has been atoned for in full. So as we conclude, all you can do is accept it or reject it. If you lack complete peace in your life, if it comes and goes as the days goes, then why not take a look, even a fresh look, at the suffering servant? The servant is God's. The suffering was ours. But in love of the Father and in love of you, he accepted it upon himself. There's not a day that goes by that you are not in his heart and on his mind, and he carries the wounds to prove it. What about your day? What about your heart? What about your mind? You need to know it is either all his or it is none of his. There's no such thing as partial salvation, partial healing or deliverance. If you would have complete and lasting peace, then come, give all to him. Accept the total package. Surrender all to him. <laughs> you can always do worse. But dear ones, you will never do better. His way or your way. Your choice. Isaiah tells us, God's suffering servant poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors, even you. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word that you proclaimed through Isaiah, pointing so many hundreds of years down the road, the realization that Jesus was coming and now has come and has suffered what he went through for each of us today.
that we might walk in unity with you through him. But dear ones, you might be out there today without that unity, without this love of God in your heart, without an understanding, as you must surely have now, that it was all done for you, this suffering Messiah. Maybe now you would like to take him into your life. Maybe now you'd like to rededicate your life to him. And if that's you, dear one, then I invite you now to say this prayer with me. Father God, thank you. Thank you for loving me so much to give your only begotten Son. Thank you that even while I am a sinner, he died for me, for my sins. And now, as I confess myself to be a sinner, it is my heart's desire, dear Father, to be a sinner saved by grace. So I open my heart. I invite you, dear Jesus, to come into my life, take control of my life, sit on the throne of my life, be my life. And I promise, as you enable me through your indwelling spirit, to live that life for you, that you might live your life through me. And dear ones, if that was your prayer today, then I want you to know, I want you to know that Jesus made a promise to you. And that promise will be yours for a lifetime. And you can see it for yourself in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, where Jesus said, listen, listen, I stand at the door and knock. That was the door of your heart. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door as you have, that I will come into him, and that dear one is where he is by the Holy Spirit in you. And I will dine with him, and he with me, and dear friends, that speaks of an everlasting, ever increasing fellowship that only grows stronger and, and sweeter as the days, and yes, even as the years go by, and you engage yourself in God's word and in the fellowship of prayer. Now, dear friends, I hope that you will join with us next time as we once more gather around God's word and begin following Jesus through the Gospel of John. Because as I always say, I believe Father God has something special for us. But until then, God bless and bye-bye.